at Edvard Munch's The Scream. It's uh, Halloween coming up and I thought it would be a great time to look at this piece. It's so overused, but actually there's something quite ghoulish, menacing and sort of intense about it, which always draws us back. There are so many unusual facts about this piece. For example, The Scream is not the name that Munch gave it in the first place. The German title that he originally gave it calls it The Scream of Nature. And if that's translated to Norwegian, which uh, Munch was Norwegian, it means shriek. And actually, this figure is not so much screaming, but nature around it is screaming. And this figure is just responding by putting its hands over its ears to drown the sound out. That may change the meaning, and we'll look at that more in the next video. You know, there are other interesting facts about this. For example, there's not one, but five images made of this by Munch. He produced two paintings, two drawings and a lithograph, all between the years of 1893, which this was made in, the first one, and 1910. Spanning, you know, 17 years is a long time to keep producing a similar drawing. At the time, his sister was in an asylum not too far away from this exact location, which has been pinpointed in Norway. And this potentially is a response to the personal um, emotional anguish going on in his life. If only Munch had not listened to his anti-establishment nihilistic friend who encouraged him to paint in this style and to show his emotions through his painting, that we would never have any of this work in the first place because he would have carried on in a life in maths and physics. We're looking at what possessed him to paint this in the first place. By looking at this picture, we'd be forgiven for thinking that this was an intense spur of the moment emotional reaction to something that had happened in Munch's life. But actually, there's an oil sketch of this exact composition from a few years prior. That this composition obviously meant something to him because even after this piece, he went on to make replicas of this four more times in his life. He's trying to convey his thoughts in this image. We can see the brush strokes are so vivid and the colours almost screaming at us. We can see that Munch is trying to use his pictures as a message to convey his emotions. And actually, his anti-establishment and nihilistic friend encouraged him away from a life in physics and maths and towards this life of expressing himself through art and expressing himself through his brushstrokes and the way he paints. There was a lot of emotional torment in Munch's life. He um, was preoccupied from evading an unfortunate mental condition that affected his family. His mother died when he was quite young and his sister was in mental asylum and he suffered from depression himself. Not only that, but he didn't get on with his dad. His dad also had um, unfortunate mental health issues and his dad was a religious man and really didn't see eye to eye with the way that Munch was living his life, which didn't really get any better throughout his life. At one point, Munch's father cut off the funds and he also destroyed one of his works, which um, his father really did not like, especially after there was some press backlash from the type of work that Munch was producing at that time. We're looking at why he used this particular composition. We know it reflects his emotions, but why did he choose this scene? Well, he's written about it and he said one evening he was walking, one sunset evening, and the sky turned a blood red, he said. And he said he painted the sky this blood colour. And he also said he heard this shrieking, this screaming passing through nature. The colours shrieked, he said. Well, we know that the sky could be blood red for two reasons. Number one, at this latitude in Norway, there is a particular red that the colour of the sky goes at particular times in the year, and it's only found at this latitude in Norway. And the other reason is potentially that 10 years before this painting was painted, Mount Krakatoa actually erupted and the skies turned a particular red due to the particles emitted into the atmosphere. And this uh, spread throughout Northern Europe and parts of the world. Munch could have seen this and reflected it here. Art historians have also discovered this is a particular location near a fjord, near to Oslo. And we know this because of the exact way that the bridge is represented here and the exact waterway here. This point, this vantage point must have meant a lot to Munch because we know he walked past there and felt this emotion. This figure is also suggested to be a Peruvian mummy. We know that in Paris in 1889, there was an exhibition of Peruvian mummies and actually his friend Gauguin use the Peruvian mummy as a sort of vessel to paint figures in his work and it could likely be that Munch did the same here and actually it works well because this figure is genderless and it sort of represents the whole of humanity, the suffering of the whole of humanity. 
um, we, we notice that it's genderless and actually it, it has no tells or, or particular identity um, and it really resonates with all of us. We're looking at what the critics thought at the time. Posthumously, it's received a load of success. The two paintings have been stolen, suggesting its value, and one of the drawings has sold for the fourth most amount of money at public auction. But Munch's relationship with the press, the media and the public was not always this rosy. At the start of his artistic career, he experimented with the impressionistic styles and he developed a style a bit like Manet. And the press widely panned this. Munch's father didn't help and he was a critic too. And he actually cut off Munch's funds to help fund his art life. He also destroyed one of his works, which was likely a nude going against his viewpoints. But it didn't also help that one of Munch's uncles was a really successful, established traditional artist. Munch's father, though, he died in 1889, and this was a real pivotal moment, a real step change in Munch's artistic life. He started spending more time in Paris, and he was influenced by the post-impressionists and other artists, the symbolists who were there, and Munch developed a more distinctive style. He had a nervous breakdown in 1908 and he stopped binge drinking and he really changed his outlook both personally and artistically to a more positive outlook and the positive output of art. He was shown more in museums in his local town, he was written about more and he had a much more positive relationship with the press and with the critics. He received a lot of success from his patrons who wanted him to paint portraits of them, etc. And he actually became relatively successful. When the Second World War um, came to pass, Munch's works were banned. And it's only thanks to the fact they weren't destroyed that we now have this legacy and we can see uh, what a great artist and what an important pivotal artist he was. We're looking at the materials and the style that Munch employed in his piece here, The Scream. We know this is a planned composition, it's not a one-off. There are five versions of it, spanning over 17 years. Two paintings, two drawings, one lithograph, and a bunch of prints. We know that the two paintings have been stolen. I mean, it just shows the, the reverence placed on these two works that they've been stolen. One of the drawings fetched the fourth most amount of money at public auction at $120 million. I mean, that says something about the reverence that is placed upon this, this suite of works. The style here that Munch employed was the same in, in every piece. He used these swirling brush strokes, these vortex, this intense perspective the intense shrieking colours, as he called them. He flip-flopped between a more realist style and a more expressive style. And, and I mean, here it's unmistakable. We can see these swirling brush strokes. We can see this intense um, perspective used to draw our eye to this figure. And we can see it's very unsettling and uneasy and it's all enhanced to do just what it says, make us have an emotional response. And this is really the key of his expressive, his synthesis style. He did actually have a change in his artistic style again when he had a breakdown and he had a more positive outlook on, on life and on his art creative output. It made him increasingly popular as well. We're looking at the artistic movements that influenced him to paint this. It's first worth noting that his sister and his father influenced him in their own ways to create this. First of all, his sister, because she was his muse for a couple of his works, she was in a mental asylum when he painted this. Upon her death, Munch painted a piece that was known or coined as his first soul painting, in inverted commas. She really was his muse in a lot of his paintings and artwork. His father also encouraged him to paint this in, in so far as Munch's friend was this nihilistic anti-establishment guy who encouraged him to paint in this expressive style, much to the aggravation of Munch's father, who was a pious man and who went against his beliefs. And in a way, because of his fractured relationship with his son Munch, it encouraged Munch to paint. Munch also spent a lot of time in Paris after his father's death and, you know, he was involved at the time with the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists. Munch found the Impressionists a bit too simplistic and a bit too much like a scientific experiment with their colour juxtapositions, etc. And he felt himself much more akin with uh, the Post-Impressionists and the Symbolists who really used 
objects as vessels to express what they wanted to. And Mook wanted to go deeper, he wanted to have um, expressive content. So he, along with his um, friends Van Gogh and Gauguin, shared these same views about the Impressionists and they all followed this more symbolist and more expressive um, view. Mook also had a nervous breakdown. When this happened, he really changed his style output as well. It became a bit more positive. Um, he created works for patrons, their, their portraits, and he, he had actually more success during this time. We're looking at artistically who he influenced with this work. Firstly, we need to look to Norway, and it's probably the most iconic artwork to come out of that country. So. He's probably the most celebrated Norwegian artist and he's really influenced the artistic output of his own country. But upon his death, the German Expressionist really continued his legacy of his work and they agreed with his philosophy where he said that I do not believe in the art which is not the compulsive result of man's urge to open his heart. So the German Expressionists did a lot when he died to continue his style of work or his his artistic ethos. More recently in the pop art movement Andy Warhol produced a silkscreen painting of this image and he wanted to desacralize this image. I mean so much reverence is placed on it, it's fetched so much money at auction, you know it's so revered, it's so iconic that Andy Warhol merely sought to sort of devalue the, the image. Of course he's never going to devalue in literal terms the original um, painting the original works by Munch, but that notion was there. He was putting social commentary on this piece. Also more recently, in 2013, the Norwegian Mint made a celebratory coin, or commemorative coin, using this artwork on one side of the coin to uh, commemorate the 150th anniversary of, of Munch's birth in Hollywood. Now, they have really been influenced in a couple of ways, especially with this piece of work. If we think of Home Alone, when Kevin McAllister is left home alone at Christmas. There's an iconic image of Kevin clasping his hands to his cheeks in a shocked view, like this image here. Halloween-led film, The Scream, has used this shocked look, their ghoulish sort of expressions for that film. And this work even has its own emoji. And um, there's only one of two works which has its own emoji. Um, I've not found the emoji yet, and I'm looking forward to finding it when I do. But the other picture which has an emoji is the Wave by Hokusai. It is so iconic and it is the subject of our next mini series. I hope you like this video. If you do, tune in next series. Please subscribe to our page. Please like this video and please share with your friends. Thank you.